so thank you all for joining us today for this timely panel discussion on the topic of space weather readiness. Uh, my name is Britt Lindgren. I'm an associate professor of physics and astronomy at the University of North Carolina Asheville, and I'm also an associate fellow with the Duke Space Diplomacy Lab. I'm very excited to have the opportunity today to moderate a discussion with three of the world's top experts in the monitoring and mitigation of space weather. Uh, before I start, I want to quickly thank one of our own UNC Asheville students, Adam Griffey, for bringing the importance of this topic to my attention uh, last semester and actually inspiring this event. So thank you, Adam. Um, many of you have probably been paying attention to the news, and if so, you may have uh, noticed that likely or that, that recently there's been increasing frequency um, in the number of stories about the northern lights, um, even uh, many cases of them appearing at lower latitudes where they're not normally visible. Uh, these increasing displays are expected as we approach the peak of the sun's 11 year cycle, but not everyone may be aware that critical ground and space based infrastructure also face an elevated risk of damage from the same space weather events that produce the aurora. Solar storms are capable of damaging satellites that individuals and governments rely upon for communications, GPS, weather forecasting, and even intelligence, making space weather preparedness an important topic of modern international concern. Uh, with this being said, we're delighted to be joined today by three top experts leading the U.S. efforts to predict and mitigate adverse space weather events, uh, Dr. Tammy Dickinson, Dr. Jenny Meehan, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mr. Bill Murtaugh. After I take a few minutes to introduce them, our panelists will share some background on the science of space weather and discuss the roles they each play in domestic and international space weather preparedness. And then in the remaining 20 minutes or so, we'll have time for questions and discussion. And we invite um, all of those uh, who have joined in today to drop your questions in the Q&A at any time. Uh, so I'll start first uh, introducing Dr. Tammy Dickinson, who's the founder and president of Science Matters Consulting, LLC. She provides professional services at the intersection of science and government to influence national policy and assist organizations to ensure sound science is available to inform policy and management decisions across the earth, environmental and space sciences, and disaster and climate resilience fields. Dr. Dickinson currently serves as chair of the White House Space Weather Advisory Group, known as SWAG. Uh, she served as the principal assistant director for environment and energy at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, hereafter OSTP where she coordinated the federal government's activities to better prepare the U.S. for the impacts of climate change, also to promote sustainable development, to foster new and cleaner source of energy, uh, sources of energy, to enable the earth and space sciences, and to build the nation's disaster resilience. Temi coordinated and administered the environment, national resources, and earth and space science research and development portfolio across the federal government and integrated their activities with non-governmental, academic, private sector and international partners. Dr. Dickinson oversaw the National Ocean Council, US Global Change Research Program and Interagency Committees on Earth Observing, Air and Water Quality, Disaster Risk Reduction, Space Weather, Ecological Services, Toxins, the Arctic and Ocean Science and Technology. Prior to working at the Obama White House, Dr. Dickinson led scientific and policy activities and developed and implemented the National Geographical I'm sorry, National Geological and Geophysical Data Preservation Program and the Geology Laboratory Program at the U.S. Geological Survey. Prior to joining USGS, Tammy held several positions at the National Research Council, including as a Senior Program Officer for the Committee on Earth Resources, Acting Associate Director for the National uh, Materials Advisory Board, and the Board on Manufacturing and Engineering Design, and Associate Director and Acting Director for the Space Studies Board. She has also held program management and science policy positions at the National Science Foundation and NASA headquarters. Dr. Dickinson is a recipient of numerous awards and honors, including the Department of Interior Superior Service Award and Meritorious Service Award, and is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. She even has an asteroid named after her in her honor of her research, in honor of her research and program management work. Uh, that asteroid is named 1981 EU 22 Tammy Dickinson. Very impressive. <laughs> uh, Dr. Uh, Jennifer Jenny Meehan is the National uh, Space Weather Program Manager for Analyze, Forecast, and Support Office at the National Weather Service headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland. Jenny provides the coordination needed within NOAA and across the federal government to ensure a space weather ready nation. 
Jenny works with NOAA's Space Weather, Space Weather Prediction Center on issues related to global, national, regional, and local policy, products, and services that impact the way NWS communicates space weather information to core partners, the space weather enterprise, and the general public. She serves as a member of several teams, committees, review panels, and interagency technical committees. Jenny also serves as the Executive Secretary of the White House Space Weather Operations Research and Mitigation, or SWARM, subcommittee, which is composed of senior officials from 34 different U.S. federal departments, agencies, and offices, and the Executive Office of the President. SWARM is mandated to coordinate U.S. Executive Branch actions and activities to improve the understanding and prediction um, and preparation for, uh, sorry, prediction of and preparation for space weather phenomena. She is also helping to lead NOAA's mandated responsibilities with the 2020 passage of the Promoting Research and Observations of Space Weather to Improve the Forecasting of Tomorrow, or PRO-SWIFT Act, where she is appointed as the designated federal officer of the Space Weather Advisory Group. Prior to joining uh, NOAA, Jenny served as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Air Force Institute of Technology, located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, and that took her to Greenland for work funded by uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as DARPA. Uh, Jenny earned her PhD in physics from Utah State University in 2017 with a focus on alleviating space weather effects on GPS by better characterizing the ionosphere to advance physics-driven forecast models. She also holds a BS in meteorology from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Welcome, Jenny. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Bill Murtaugh currently serves as the program uh, coordinator for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center, which is located in Boulder, Colorado. Bill is NOAA's space weather lead in coordinating preparedness and response efforts with industry, emergency managers, and government agencies around the world. Bill also serves as the National Weather Service lead in the White House Office and of Science and Technology Policies Interagency Com uh, Committee to develop and in implement actions in the National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan. In October 2016, uh, uh, Bill completed a 26-month assignment with OSTP as the Assistant Director for Space Weather. In his position at the White House, he oversaw the development and implementation of the 2015 National Space Weather Strategy and Action Plan, and also coordinated efforts to develop Executive Order uh, 13744, which is known as Coordinating Efforts to Prepare the Nation for Space Weather Events. He regularly briefs the White House, Congress, and other go governmental leadership on space weather and the vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure to space weather storms, Bill is also a key contributor to U.S. government efforts to advance international cooperation in space weather-related activities. He is a regular guest speaker at universities and national and international conferences, where he is right now. He has also provided numerous interviews to major media outlets and is featured in several documentaries on space weather. Before joining, joining NOAA, Bill was a weather forecaster in the U.S. Air Force. He coordinated and provided meteorological support for national security interests around the world. Bill transferred to uh, SWPC in 1997 uh, as a U.S. Air Force space weather forecaster and liaison between NOAA and the U.S. Air Force. He joined NOAA in 20, uh, 2003 after retiring from the Air Force with 23 years of military service. Thank you so much to all three of you. It's such a delight um, to have you here, especially all together. I'm really glad that we could find a date to make this possible. Um, so with that, with that introduction being said, I think I'll pass it over to Bill to start us off. Yes, Jenny, you're going to show the slides, right? All right, go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak here. It's, it's a pleasure and certainly an honor to do this. Uh, it, space weather indeed over the last decade has emerged as something of great concern around the globe and hopefully you get that sense uh, why that is when we get through with our presentation material here. A lot's happening, a lot still needs to happen, but uh, let's jump into it. And what, I, what we'll do is I'm going to talk 
I'm at the Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder. You can see the pictures behind me is, the, is essentially the operation center. And I'm going to talk from that perspective, uh, the op center, what we do, a little bit about space weather and background, just to kind of set the stage for the discussions that when we transition into policy drivers, which my colleague Jenny is going to talk about, the many efforts underway in the White House and on the Hill and across departments and agencies to address space weather. And that last piece is key then, as um, you'll see in our discussions here, there was a lot of great things happening in the federal government, but more needed that, needed to be a whole of community approach. We really rely on academia and, and uh, the, uh, the um, industry and whatnot to help us get where we need to be. And Tammy's taken a key role after being in the government and working in the White House, she continues her efforts now uh, from, from the private sector. So uh, let's, let's uh, jump right into it, Jenny. Next slide, please. So the, the Space Weather Prediction Center is a, there's two centers in this nation response, two government centers responsible for the provision of space weather services. We are one, obviously, the Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder, and we handle everything other than the DOD. So the, we do not have a classified mission in, uh, in Boulder. We leave that in the very capable hands of our colleagues in the Air Force. They operate out of off of the Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. But we do work very, very closely. There's a lot of overlap, as you can imagine, between our, uh, our, our objectives and our efforts. When you consider, for example, that the DOD currently 50, 60 percent, we rely 50, 60 percent of our national security satellite communication capability is provided by the private sector. So the Intel sats, Inmarsats, SES satellite, Iridium, et cetera, provide these services. And of course they are, because they are private sector industry, they are our responsibility. So we have to work very closely together because the consequence on any given system can have profound effects across national security uh, in, in this nation. So we do issue alerts, warnings, and watches based on these three different types of space weather, geomagnetic storms, solar, energy, solar radiation storms, and the radio blackouts. So the geomagnetic storms are the, the magnetic field when we see big uh, coronal mass ejections. I'll touch on that here in just a section, a session in a second. And then solar radiation storms, energetic protons, and solar flare radio blackouts is the electromagnetic emission. But these eruptions, all three types, can affect the technology here on Earth. So we operate kind of like a regular weather station, uh, except we're operating 24-7, but we do not issue warnings, alerts for hurricanes, tornadoes, or anything like that. We're monitoring the sun and the space environment. Next slide, please. So those three different scales, just to touch base, it's kind of our space weather 101 here. Space weather for all practical purposes originates from the sun. Uh, that's where we fall. If you at the, you can see behind me there, those images, we have lots of different ways of looking at the sun. We're monitoring the sun, sunspots. We're monitoring what we call active regions on the sun, trying to assess their potential to erupt. And when they do erupt, these sunspots, they uh, produce solar flares and coronal mass ejections. And the three different types of emissions are captured here, and it's what we base our, our scales on. And the three different types of emission and how it interacts with the Earth's magnetic field and the Earth's ionosphere and the technology contained within, that is essentially uh, space weather. Next slide, please. So, and the reason we do it, uh, you know, we have, it's, it's, we've created an extraordinary vulnerability, unlike any other, especially in this nation, and it's because of our reliance on technology, and that's what I'm capturing here on this slide. You take any of these out of the equation. If you take, if we went without GPS for a day, what is the consequence to this nation? Quite profound. If we took some of these satellites we rely on for so much of what we do, what's the consequences? Again, very significant. And most importantly, in the upper left-hand side, the reason more than anything else that drove policy to address space weather is the potential impact on the power grid. Recognizing that we could get a 
big geomagnetic storm that could take a large chunk of this grid out across this country for a prolonged period of time that was a game changer in how we are going to address space weather. Everything doesn't have to get elevated to the White House. Why did this? Largely because of that. I remember getting to the White House and working with Tammy back in 2014, and the leadership there said, listen, if we get a Category 5 hurricane bearing down on Miami, that's a bad day, but it's a regional or local effect. A geomagnetic storm that knocks the grid out from New England down through the Carolinas and up to the Western Great Lakes region is much more significant, if, especially if somebody says that power is going to be out for not hours or days, but weeks or months. That vulnerability is what concerned us more than anything else, because that vulnerability or that type of impact would affect our ability to govern. So all sorts of different types of impacts. And you can see the astronauts. It's it's extraordinary at the Space Weather Prediction Center right now to, to sit in and, and coordinate across so many sectors on space weather support because all of these technologies can't be impacted. We're going back to the moon, as you all know. The Artemis 1 is flowing, the Artemis 2 later uh, next year, and then Artemis 3 landing on the moon in the next three to four years. Once you get outside the protective cocoon of Earth's magnetic field, that radiation exposure, it's a whole different ballgame. So we work very closely with NASA, making sure that they have the information they need to keep the astronauts safe during these big space weather events. So bottom line here, all different types of technologies that we rely on for everything we do today have degrees of vulnerability in the space weather, and we are doing what we can to help mitigate those effects. Next slide. And I did want to just uh, emphasize national security. When we talk about impacts on communications and GPS on satellites, obviously our national security interest uh, can be affected. And, you know, it's extraordinary and just in the last year or two, everyone's kind of aware of the threat of cyber attack. And that has played into this whole thing with space weather. It's all about attribution because guess what? You look at the impacts of a cyber attack on some of these technologies, especially satellites, and guess what? It looks like space weather. So attribution is key. What is affecting our systems, whether it's a radar on the ground, over the horizon radar, or space systems, whatever the case may be, immediate understanding of what's causing the problems is, is, is absolute paramount to, to, to know for situational awareness, and to know the right course of action. So lots of impact across all sorts of uh, national security interests. So again, we work very closely to address those threats. Next slide, please. You'll see, and you know, we talk a lot about extreme space weather events uh, because it is a big concern. If we have a really big event, like I, I've mentioned, taking down the power, right? that is that has not happened. We've had impacts to the grid. We had a big power outage across the entire province of Quebec and the city of Montreal back in 89. We know it can happen, but we've not had a big widespread outage. Uh, so we do kind of focus on those big events a lot because of that. But recognize this. Just look at the headlines on the right-hand side there from over the last decade or so, and you'll see space weather occurs all the time affecting different technologies. Uh, you'll see that most recently there, the uh, New York Times article on the SpaceX incident. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but yeah, others on the lower right-hand side, powerful solar storm delays SpaceX rocket, stalls oil rigs in Canada. They'd be relying on GPS, but there's all sorts of uh, impacts on space weather all the time. And on the left-hand side, I just wanted to emphasize that when we get this information into the right hands, the satellite operators, the electric power grid operators, the airline dispatchers and whatnot, they will ensure actions are taken to mitigate the effects of space weather. Sometimes I hear people say, well, a big space weather event occurred, but I didn't hear about any impacts. So it was a false alarm. It is not a false alarm. If we get the right information into the right hands and these people do the right thing, guess what? There are no impacts. That is the goal, to eliminate impacts of space weather by getting that information into their hands in a timely manner. But lots of things happen across the various sectors to protect these critical assets during space weather storms. Next slide.
So I just want to touch on just a couple of examples. This, uh, the, event, the event that occurred in September 2017 is one of the things that causes us some grief. And it is this, that if a space weather occurs at the wrong time, making a bad situation worse. And that was the situation in September 2017. I don't know if there's any weather buffs among us, but you'll remember it was the period when we had Hurricane Maria, Hurricane Irma. These are Category 4, 5 type hurricanes impacting the Caribbean. And at the same time, solar flares occur. When those islands were hit, it knocks out the infrastructure. You can watch the cell phone drop out over the course of several hours in a day or two to essentially nothing from the islands because there is no power to recharge. And these folks are pulling out car batteries, charging up HF, high frequency communication capabilities to communicate back to the mainland here in the US to share with, with the rest of us in the emergency response community what is happening and what is needed. And this was a bad situation. This information was getting, uh, it was, was absolutely degraded because of space weather events just at the wrong time. This was an example from the, for the aviation purposes. We're trying to route flights around these hurricanes and we're getting all sorts of interference on our communication communication capability. You'll see in that last sentence, a lot of misinformation was being stated to the FAA. And that's a big problem in our business is accurate communication because people just do not understand space weather, do not understand what might be happening in their systems. Next, Jenny. Uh, we also got this from the Hurricane WatchNet, the amateur folks operating on the HF, and they obviously were having big problems communicating with the islands. It was just aviation, and you'll see the guy says, I love to take these quotes, I'm not sure how long this blackout will last, but these flares could not happen at a worse time. Mother Nature is not playing well. So just some nice examples of uh, what can happen at just the wrong time when space weather events occur during our response to other emergencies. Next slide, please. And this was an incident that occurred in November 2015 that has a lot of us concerned. Big, big solar radio burst associated with a big flare, and it's saturated the radar systems in Sweden, the air traffic control radar systems, is so badly that they had to shut the airspace down. Needless to say, we appreciate the consequence of what that looks like in the United States. We have a big weather event that affects O'Hare or New York City and, the, and the, any of the hub cities. Uh, the consequence across the nation is profound. We are in the process of trying to assess whether such an event, a space weather event, could disrupt our systems here in the United States as it did back in uh, 2015. But again, just a nice example of the things that can happen. And this was not an extreme event. This was fairly average type space weather storm. Next, please. And this one occurred in February 2022. So the last example I'll just give here. SpaceX is launching thousands of satellites into lower Earth orbit, one of the several mega constellations that's causing um, that's causing us to, to, to readjust our services to the satellite community. And these folks launched in February of, during a minor geomagnetic storm in February of 2022. They released those spacecraft at about 210 kilometers. And uh, lo and behold, during the geomagnetic storm, it had changed the density at that orbit and they were not expecting it. And most of those satellites went this way, down, back, uh, and burned up as opposed to going up to their permanent orbit due to a space, due to a geomagnetic storm. The good news on this is we were on the phone with those folks within hours after that happening. And a lot has happened since, including a big meeting in Boulder just two weeks ago where we had SpaceX, Starlink, uh, we had Leo Labs, Spire, all those big companies with mega constellations all in the room together, government working with industry to make sure this doesn't happen again. Next slide. So just finish up with the last couple of things. When we get a big space weather event, this is what the distribution will look like. We will contact FEMA headquarters. That information gets redistributed across emergency responders across federal, state, and local levels. We contact the situation room and advise them what's happening. 
We contact the North American Electric Reliability Corporation who take our information and redistribute it to all power generation and transmission owners and operators across the nation and indeed Canada too because of our linkage to the, to the grid in Canada. We will contact all watch centers in all federal departments and agencies, get the information to them so they can ensure the primary mission essential functions can be completed. And we'll control, we will co contact Mission Control at NASA and Johnson Space Center so that take, they can take actions necessary to protect the astronauts. We also have a subscription service with 70,000 subscribers with this information going out to everyone. So there's an extraordinary distribution of information, trying to get the right information at the right hands at the right time to do what's necessary to protect these critical assets. Next slide. And it's the international piece. I know it's part, of, very much a part of the discussion with the Duke Space Diplomacy Lab, so I wanted to bring it up. Yes, internationally, this is not a U.S. concern alone. We work very closely with many nations around the world. The bilateral relations have been established and in the intergovernmental organizations within NATO, the United Nations, uh, European Space Agency, all various elements uh, contained within to address space weather, where, whether it's operations, research, protection, preparedness, etc. Across the board, we are working globally to address the issue of space weather. Next slide, Jenny. And the last thing I just wanted to touch on from sticking with the international piece, we've worked with the state, we've got over 270 posts embassies and consulates around the world, some of them in locations with less than stable infrastructure, as you all know. During big space weather events, we gotta make sure these folks understand what's happening so that they know what systems to rely on or what might be happening in their systems at just the wrong time. So we worked with the State Department just this past summer and they will redistribute at the Operations Center the space weather information to these 270 plus embassies and consulates around the world. They've done a great job at the State Department because some of these products are relate, relate to only certain latitudes or certain longitudes, daytime versus nighttime. They don't just resend everything out. They've, they've uh, developed a software where it'll capture what's needed and send it only to the right location. So excellent job at the State Department. Next slide. All right, so that's it from the introduction to space weather, just to give you a sense why we do what we do and to give you some sense that, yes, policy needed to be established to address this threat, both at national and indeed international level. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jenny Meehan, now to talk about some of those policy initiatives uh, over the last uh, decade. Jennifer. Yeah, thank you, Bill. So Bill um, explained exactly why we have to take action in this country to figure out how we could prepare this nation and become a space weather ready nation. And so there were many things that took place. Um, beginning in uh, 2014, the workforce to stand up the space weather um, subcommittee in the White House, which was initially a task force led by Tammy, as you heard in the bios. And so that was done um, and the first cohesive all government strategy was formed in 2015 that defined six high level goals to understand, prepare and mitigate the effects of space weather in order to facilitate that operational readiness and to improve the decision makings across the federal government. Um, shortly thereafter, executive order was uh, signed by the president to coordinate those efforts to prepare the nation uh, for space weather events. And so it set the, the policy and defined the roles um, of the agencies and the responsibilities and then directed actions uh, to prepare the nation. Okay, to, uh, 2018, the National Defense Authorization Act uh, was passed. So it, it, okay. it, clear, it was clear the sense of Congress that the uh, Secretary of Defense should ensure timely provision of operational space weather services that may affect the weapon systems, military operations, or the defense of the United States. Continuing, so when that first strategy and action plan uh, was made uh, public in 2016, it had a disclaimer in there and said, hey, you need to uh, revisit it every three to four years uh, and see what still applies and what doesn't. And so that uh, strategy and action plan was re-released uh, in 2019, an update. So in that action, there was 88 actions directing the activities of the federal government to ensure the effective policies and procedures that will form the backbone of a space weather ready nation. 
Um, and executive order the same day came out to coordinate the national resilience to electro electromagnetic pulses, which really defined the policy of the United States to prepare against the effects of GMPs through targeted approaches that coordinate, again, that whole government activity, right? It's not just one government agency that could take on this, uh, this incredible effort that space weather requires. And so it really is to coordinate the government as a whole uh, how can we leverage each other's, each other's missions uh, to tackle uh, this issue? And so the UN International Civil Aviation Organization, so Bell mentioned this is, uh, we are closely tied with our international ally, allies across uh, the globe. And, um, and one of the ways that we do this is by the International Civil Aviation Organization, which recognized that we need to support the aviation sector and providing those very specific aviation products uh, for space weather. And so four global centers were uh, formed uh, to provide those services for our aviation community. Uh, the Space Weather Prediction Center in Boulder provides, uh, is one of those global centers. Um, a consortium of Australia, Canada, France, and Japan was formed as another global center. And then China and Russia formed a global center. And then Australia, Belgium, uh, Finland, Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, the UK, and Cyprus all formed to, fill, uh, to produce the Pegasus Global Center. So there's four global centers that rotate every two weeks to provide uh, space weather services for the aviation community. Um, and they rotate every two weeks. And so they hand it off and then there's a backup center and then there's a stand, uh, center on standby. And so it's, it's something that came together and stood up in 2019 and is ongoing its effort now. And then the FERC standard, this was, this was critical because this, as Bill mentioned, the power grid really got the attention at the levels of the White House. And so this FERC standard then required the owners uh, to conduct those, those critical vulnerability assessments of how space weather could disturb their systems. And then also requires the actions uh, to, for them to go look at the SWIFTSI products and uh, incorporate that into their assessments. And then the big one happened. Our very first piece of space weather legislation uh, was a bipartisan effort, unanimous uh, support um, that uh, we must stand up legislation and the pro, the pro Act, acts so of promoting research and observations of space weather to improve the forecasting act of uh, tomorrow that was signed in, in October 2020 um, by President Trump. So I will note the swarm task force uh, stood up um, and, and produced the national strategy and action plan and the Obama administration. That swarm task force was carried over into the Trump administration. So it's one of those, uh, those, those efforts, space weather is one of those, it's very important, we need to carry it despite the administration and we really need to do something about it. And so this, this was shown uh, with this passage of the ProSwift Act, which stood up uh, the space weather advisory group and also the National Academies Roundtable to facilitate that communication transfer and technology transfer from the federal government or from our academic, our commercial sector, our non-governmental end users to the government and so forth. And then in 2021, um, the US Space Party's framework uh, was released and it, it clearly states the United States will protect space related critical infrastructure to enhance the protection of terrestrial cr critical infrastructure from space weather events. So that's a lot of the policy that drives the work of the SWARM. So the SWARM is that White House subcommittee uh, that was led uh, by Tammy to stand up. Bill was there to help spin it up as well, uh, which is very much uh, an act uh, today. It's a well world machine. Uh, ProSwift Act said, okay, this is great. We're actually gonna make this law. So law is, uh, so the SWARM is no longer a discretionary subcommittee. Um, depending on the administration, it has to be there uh, to continue this space with our effort. And so it is, it's a big subcommittee. There's 34 different uh, departments, agencies, and offices. There's over 100 members of uh, support staff for this effort. Um, it is co-chaired by um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, the, the current Assistant Director of Space Policy. It's also chaired by the Assistant Administrator for Weather Service Services, which is our National Weather Service Director. And it also is uh, co-chaired by DHS, the, by the Assistant Director of Critical risk or national risk management center. So then it breaks into being led according to the strategy and action plan that was released in 2019. And so objective one is to enhance the protection of the national security, homeland security and commercial assets of operations against the effects of space weather. That objective is led by DHS and the Department of Defense. Objective two, which is led by NOAA and NASA is to develop and disseminate the accurate and timely space weather characterization and forecast. 
And then objective three is led by FEMA and NOAA. So it establishes the plans and procedures for responding to and recovering from space weather events. So current swarm priorities um, in this ever-changing environment is we really need to establish a formal framework of how to get the research findings in the space weather community to improve the models, improve the observations, and then get that into the operational environment so we could produce products that make sense for the people that need them. And so what we did in March of 20, uh, 2022, we released the first ever formal far, uh, framework for the swarm. So it's a multi-agency effort saying, okay, NASA, you know, and NSF, and USGS, the great research that you're doing and these um, research uh, observations, we'd like to figure out how we could then process it through a funnel and get it into operations. And so defining the roles and responsibilities and how we could do that was one of the major accomplishments um, of the SWARM last year. And then this led to a quad agency, interagency agreement or MOA, uh, Memorandum of Agreement, uh, to then enact this uh, framework. And so that was just signed a few months ago, uh, which was a big effort for the space weather community. So, um, and then refine the space weather benchmarks. So how do we quantify that nature and intensity of an extreme space weather event to then provide that input for the risk informed decisions that need to be made uh, for the operators of the critical infrastructure? And a big one, Bill mentioned it, the space weather scale. So we need to assess and update those uh, space weather scales in coordination with the public and private sector. So we work, we're working right now to stand that up. So the space weather scales were um, released in 1999. So a very long time ago, a lot has changed. Um, a, a lot of the services, right? So space weather effects technology um, and our critical infrastructure, which has changed substantially since the late nineties. And so we really need to go visit that scale um, and see the products that we're producing, if it still makes sense for the community that needs it. And so that project is underway. Um, that will be an international effort. And of course we will um, be advised by our advisory group on how best to do this. Another priority is to sustain the operational satellite mission at least 1 million miles upstream at that critical L1 point um, here. And so uh, a very exciting thing, um, a, a, a bilateral um, effort is NOAA and ESA, so the European Space Agency, have signed a partnership and agreement for space with our collaborations. So we, the US, through NOAA, will provide a future L1 mission. Currently, uh, we have Discover at that L1, L1 uh, location, which we like to call the buoy, sitting out in space. So as there's a space weather event that comes off the sun, it heads, if it's heading towards Earth, it, we pick it up at our L1 position and we're able to say, okay, it's gonna come towards Earth and this is the intensity. And so it's really, it's a critical um, point of observations, critical data uh, for the models that we use and the products that we produce. And so sustaining that um, is, is really important. And so we do have a mission plan to be launched in 25. And then um, our European colleagues said, okay, y'all do L1, we'll do L5. And so we have um, that collaboration and that, uh, that mission is Vigil, which will be launched, I believe in the late 20s. Okay, more priorities. Um, Bill mentioned support for human space flight. It is a new era of, of returning back to the moon and on to Mars. And so how best do we support this community um, and, and, and trying to understand what the need is there. And so that is certainly a priority. And then also another thing that Bill hit on is that new, uh, that new community of space traffic coordination, space situational awareness, knowing exactly what products they need because it was an eye opener uh, in last year, February of 22 with the Starlink event because a typical G1, we wouldn't really bat an eye at that, but knowing that, okay, no, there's actually communities that really uh, need to know this, this information for their awareness and getting tied into how do we create a less hazardous space environment is something that we're trying to figure out how best to support. And so that is certainly a priority in the swarm. Okay, and lastly, I just want to say that the swarm does not work in a funnel. Or it, 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 we, it really requires that entire uh, space with our enterprise and the PROSOFT Act that was passed in 2020 and signed into law really uh, understood that and stood up that space weather advisory group, which advises the swarm. So it's managed by NOAA, 
However, it advises the entire federal government on what they should do when it comes to space weather and how we advance our capabilities uh, for space weather. And so it also established the, the National Academy of Space with a roundtable, which stood up, which facilitates that communication and knowledge transfer uh, between the SWARM and um, our academic and commercial colleagues. Um, and so with that, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Tammy. So Tammy is the Space Weather Advisory Group Chair to talk about those efforts. Thank you, Jenny. Next slide. Thank you. So this is the um, list of the members of the SWAG, which is what we call the Space Weather Advisory Group. So you'll hear me throw around the term SWAG um, on the rest of this talk. I don't think you'll probably know any of these people, but the reason I put up this slide was to show the breadth of the uh, organizations and institutions that are represented from major academic institutions to um, retired federal employees to uh, air, retired airline uh, workers, et cetera. So it's a great group of people. I didn't have anything to do with putting it together, so I can say it's a great group of people. Um, they serve for three-year terms. You can serve two terms. And the chair, myself, was chosen from these 15 people by the no administrator to chair this. Next, please. So as you've heard, the ProSwift Act um, told NOAA to stand up the swag. And it also outlined very clearly what our duties were. So we're supposed to facilitate advances in the space weather enterprise, and that includes government, academic, and the private sector. Improve the ability of the US to prepare for, mitigate, respond to, and recover from a space weather phenomena. Enable the coordination and facilitation of research to operations to research, this R2O2R that was on Jenny's slides, and develop and implement the, an integrated strategy for coordinated observations. And then finally, maybe not last but least, um, to uh, conduct a comprehensive user needs survey of space weather products. Next, please. So we started with the uh, input uh, to this uh, strategy. Uh, as you heard, there has been a national space weather strategy and action plan in 2015, and then an, an update to it in 2019. And the swarm is currently uh, uh, producing a new update to the strategy, action, and implementation plan. And so they came to the SWAG and they asked us to provide them input. So we looked at the past strategies and action plans. We looked at a white paper that they wrote us so that they could tell us publicly what they've been up to. Um, we looked at all the policies and statutes that Jenny nicely ran through. And then we pulled together an in-person slash hybrid meeting in January. Um, because the SWAG is the whole of community, our, one of our primary responsibilities is to, to be the place where the um, academic community, the private sector community can all provide input into the federal government. We hosted this uh, three-day meeting. We had speakers and panelists, um, and then we had uh, also inputs from the general public at this meeting. And the report we wrote, of course, the audience was the SWARM, um, but it also was Congress because they they hatched us, and then also the space weather enterprise writ large, including our international partners. So next slide, please. So this is the report. If there's nothing sexy in here, there's no cool figures. Um, we ran out of time to do all that sort of fun stuff, uh, but it has some good content, I think. And it can be found on weather.gov backslash swag. And then it has, um, 56 recommendations based on 25 findings. We prioritize the top 11 of those recommendations as higher priorities than the rest. And it consists of, a, consists of a lot of policy recommendations and it's best taken as a package that focuses on the individual recommendation rather than focusing on the individual recommendations. I just lost the slides. Did everybody else too? Jenny, are you working on that? Thank you. And because all the recommendations are really tied together. So next slide, please. So before I dive into some of the recommendations, um, the SWAG was very impressed with what the SWARM has done over the last nine years. They've really built awareness to space weather and moved the nations towards a more resilience to space weather. But during that same time, 
The technology, the infrastructure systems, national priorities have continued to evolve, to evolve with the space domain becoming increasingly important to the national and economic security. So with that background, next slide, please. Let's look at the, some of the top 11 recommendations. Now, I'm not going to go through them all, um, but I'm going to try to highlight a couple, a few that I think might be um, of interest to this audience. The recommendations, let me start by saying they're not in priority order. So number one is not necessarily more important than number two uh, in the SWAG's uh, view. They are in the order that they appear in the document, and the numbers in parentheses at the end is where you could go to the document and find more information about that particular recommendation. So I'll start with recommendation number one, which is fund the federal space weather enterprise. So as Jenny talked about the Pro Swift Act, and you've heard it mentioned throughout this uh, briefing, uh, it was a great act. It, it codified a lot of things that Bill and I put in place when we were in the White House back in the Obama administration, but it, it was an appropriations act. So it came with no money. So a lot of it was unfunded mandates. And so Congress really needs to step forward and fund a lot of the things that they're telling the federal agencies that they need to do. So the, um, next I'll talk about um, a recommendation number four, uh, protect space weather sensors from the spectrum interference. So space weather sensors are vulnerable to and potentially at risk of spectrum interference from electronic electromagnetic emissions, such as uh, radio frequencies, originating from technology systems, such as 5G applications. Emissions at frequencies similar to those used by the space weather sensors could disrupt the sensor's ability to gather and provide data that we need for our forecasts and warnings. So appropriate domestic and international protection should be given to space weather sensors that parallel what we already give to terrestrial weather sensors. And there's an international telecommunications uh, committee meeting. It's got a fancier name than that. Coming up later this month where spectrum will be on that agenda. And that shows that it is important to the international community. So the SWAG recommended that the SWARM coordinate the establishment of domestic and global protections for space weather akin to what we are currently doing for terrestrial weather sensors. Next slide, please. So next I'll jump to benchmarks. Um, Jenny mentioned benchmarks in her briefing. Um, benchmarks were started during the, uh, as a as a consequence of the first National Strategy and Action Plan in 2015, they provide points of reference for the various types of, of space weather events that Bill mentioned in his briefing, uh, geoelectric fields, ionizing radiation, et cetera. And we are continuing to refine these benchmarks and the SWAG recommended that the SWARM do that with the input of industry. Um, some of the benchmarks are rather mature, for example, the power grid, as Bill mentioned, that's one of the places where people were most concerned if we had a major event. So their benchmarks are pretty uh, mature, but we need to make sure that industry had a role in developing those benchmarks, that they weren't just a government um, designed benchmark. And then some of, the some of the sectors, the benchmarks are not as mature and we recommend that the swarm as they develop those new benchmarks that they have industry at the table with them. And then the last, I'll jump to the last recommendation here, foster and lead a global space weather enterprise. So we recommended that the federal government should seek more opportunities to collaborate and coordinate and co-fund both observations, forecasts, and capabilities with partners and allied nations around the world. They could do this through the State Department, and they probably would do it through something like the United Nations or some similar entity. And they could should seek more opportunities to globally unify priorities, collaborate and coordinate, and even co-fund observations uh, going forward. And they gave a few examples. Um, for example, we recommended that there be more uh, formal bilateral and multilateral agreements, international agreements to support this coordinated messaging and mutual resilience. Um, we recommended that, they, that the US participate and leverage international standards development, the ISO, relevant to space environment and space weather. And then we recommended that um, the US develop a, or participate in or start a, a five eyes sorts of, of activity with respect to space weather. And five eyes are the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the US, uh, a strong collaboration there. Next, please. So we released the report in April of 2016. 23 this year, it just seems like a lot longer ago, at what's called the Space Weather Workshop, which is a big 
uh, several hundred people workshop in Boulder that's hosted by NOAA and the other federal agencies where the community comes together. We rolled out the, the, the report there. We have done a variety of other scientific and community briefings throughout the year. I have briefed the swarm, of course, and I have briefed some of the individual agency advisory committees, their federal advisory committees. I've had briefings to the various sectors, the power sector, the space traffic coordination. Uh, we've briefed multiple um, entities within the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. There was a, a Hill event in this summer called the Space Weather Enterprise, where congressional staff gathered, and we provided a briefing there. And then in September, September I was asked to brief the House Senate Science Committee staff, which um, I did with the help of my colleague, Seth Jonas, from the committee. And I hear rumor that I might be asked to brief other committees on the Hill as well. Next. So let's move on to the second activity that, that the SWAG is under, undergoing, and that is the uh, user needs survey. So this was also laid out in the ProSwift Act that we needed to do this. It laid out pretty clearly what we needed to do. We were supposed to address the adequacy of the federal government goals for the lead time, accuracy, coverage, timeliness, et cetera, et cetera, for space weather observations and forecasting, identify options to advance those goals, identify opportunities for the collections of the data, Identify methods to increase the coordination in this R2O2R that you've heard about. Identify opportunities for new technologies, research, and instrumentation to aid in the understanding, the mon monitoring, the modeling, the prediction, and the warnings of space weather. And then identify methods and technologies to improve our preparedness for a space weather event. Next, please. So we divided up the universe of space weather into sectors. It's uh, commonly done, uh, but we picked these 10 sectors shown here. Um, to the, the sectors on the left are uh, the ones that we are going to do a user needs survey on this year. The sectors on the right are ones that we, are, we put off until next year or the next time that the survey is done. Um, partly, this is just because of a workload issue. Uh, there's only 15 of us and we're volunteers, so there's only so much that Jenny can squeeze out of us on any given year. Um, each of these sectors, we, the committee created a set of common questions that we're asking across all of the sectors, plus sector specific questions that we are act, asking within each sector. We've done some of these. We've uh, completed uh, the power grid and the aviation sectors. We're partway through the research sector. Um, the space traffic coordination sector and the others will be um, the user needs survey. These are focus groups, generally virtual focus groups uh, will be uh, completed this month, I hope. And the plan is that we'll roll out some of our preliminary results in December and January at some national scientific meetings with the final results hopefully being rolled out again at the space weather workshop in April in Boulder. So next. So how can you get involved? So this, as I mentioned earlier, the SWAG is the primary avenue for the public and the community to provide advice to the SWARM and the federal agencies. So one way to keep, at least keep track of what we're doing is you can look in the federal register, which is, uh, if you haven't been in the federal register, it can be a little overwhelming, but if you go to federalregister.gov and you search on SWAG, you should start finding our notices. We put in, all of our committee meetings have to have notices in the federal register. And when we're looking, when Jenny and Bill and the Swarm are looking for new committee members, they put a call out generally in the Federal Register. So that is a place to go find information. Perhaps an easier place is to look on the SWAG website, which is at weather.gov backslash SWAG. And there, you're, there you will find all the meeting material. So from all of our previous meetings, you can see the agendas, the slides, the summaries of the meetings, et cetera, um, and the SWAG reports and the bios of, of all of the members that I showed on my first slide. And then all of our meetings are open to the public. Um, and during each meeting, we do have a public comment period. So you're welcome to register and to provide public comment. Um, tell us what's on your mind on some topic that's on the agenda or some other topic that you might be interested in. We're, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, next slide, please. With that, I thank you on behalf of all three of us for the opportunity um, to speak to you today. And here are our three email addresses in the order of which we spoke. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions here or 
feel free to email us. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that was incredibly informative, very educational. I've learned a lot. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, we're up against the hour, but I think if if you're all able to stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes, it would be great to get to a few questions. Um, I, I know from uh, a side chat that uh, Ben Schmidt is interested in asking maybe the first just to kick, kick things off. Well, thank you, Britt, and thank you, uh, <clears throat> Jenny, Tammy, and, and Bill. This has been incredible uh, to see and, and um, obviously really dovetails uh, directly with the sort of anticipatory diplomacy approach that we've been taking in this lab uh, from, from day one that um, <clears throat> Ambassador Pearson has uh, kind of spearheaded uh, for, uh, for our theoretical framework. And so what I, what I would love to ask uh, about today is um, how this fits into uh, conflict, uh, deconfliction and, uh, resolution. And also, I guess, uh, you know, pre-diplomacy that would be needed if there's a major space weather event, um, because what we're talking about here are, um, you know, events that have, have the capability of doing significant damage, not only to satellites in low earth orbit, but also, um, aircraft and, and ground stations and things like this all the way to, um, uh, electricity grids and, and things on the ground. So um, given that all of these are critical infrastructure, what is the uh, best way to deconflict this on an international level uh, to make sure that there are no unintended consequences or, um, you know, uh, assessments that these are, you know, potentially a military uh, act by a given nation against another? Uh, how, how do we make sure that this stays within the space weather lane and, and that all parties are um basically working from the same set of facts in terms of um the space weather phenomenon thank you thank you i'll take a first stab at that ben uh, it's, it's such a big issue uh, especially over the last couple of years i had mentioned in my uh, few slides that this issue of attribution is key we have to understand uh, not only our national security systems but the security systems around the world what's happening immediately. Uh, the, the, the very fact that space weather uh, impacts look like a cyber attack is cause for great concern. So a few things are happening uh, that are very important. One, in NOAA, this is part of, has always been part of a process. The information that we, that we provide for, for, the, for our services and for the nation, we make freely available to everybody. There are 20 different operation centers, space weather operation centers around the world. We actually all coordinate, believe it or not. Uh, and it does include India, China, Russia. Uh, these, these countries all have space weather centers, all relying uh, very much on the data coming from the United States. When a big event occurs, we're all looking at the same data the same thing, the same, we're having, we, we, even co we even coordinate to some degree on the forecast. But the key is, as soon as something happens, we're all looking at this, the very same thing, and we get the information. The process is set up in the United States, and I can speak for some of our 5i partners, similar, not for everyone else, but we get the information into the right hands within minutes as part of the process to make sure NORAD, uh, Space Command all get that information immediately. And the State Department also play a role. It gets a little bit sensitive, but the information does get shared with others to make sure we're all on a kind of a level playing field so there is no confusion. So very important piece of what we do. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, now just one other thing, Ben, just to touch on that. We do have a, we're, we're in the process of a developing a communications plan. Space weather is a bit of a scourge and that people don't understand it. So as a consequence, social media runs with all sorts of nonsense. And we have got to have a, some kind of formal process in place. Who's going to speak on behalf of what agencies? Who's going to speak on behalf of the White House and NOAA uh, to, to, to the public during a big space weather event? So we do we do have a, a kind of a consistency in our messaging. 
that's all being developed right now. And we're collaborating with our partners overseas, looking at their processes too, to ensure there's some consistency. So very good question, very big concern, and we are addressing it. Thank you. Uh, there's a, a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. Uh, one asks, can someone speak to the current level of preparedness, maybe in particular for the power grid, uh, for something like another Carrington event? I should probably I don't want to mon monopolize the conversation here a bit, but given that, this, that the op center, we deal with the power grid folks all the time. Jenny mentioned the game changer. And that was the FERC ruling 10 years ago, uh, 2014, 15 timeframe. The Department of Energy and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission recognized that the power grid across this country owned and operated by 3000 different private companies interconnected had a vulnerability that we just could not leave in their hands alone. We had to do something about it from a, from a, a, um, a governing perspective. We had to, the folks up in Boston and New York, Con Ed in New York City, Dominion Power in Richmond, Virginia, they know geomagnetic storms because they felt the effects. The folks in Virginia Power have put millions of dollars into mitigating this threat because they felt the effects of it in 89 in particular and knew that they, they had a vulnerability. But we, but part, you went to the mid latitude states in the Carolinas, elsewhere. They don't see much in the way of geomagnetic storms, but should we get a Carrington event, they will. So that was a problem. So the energy department stepped in and said, everybody that owns power in this company, power companies in this country will do a vulnerability assessment. So we gave them a value. We said, here's what you could experience. Now take that value, model it in your system, figure out if your system can withstand that type of geomagnetic storm. And once you do that vulnerability assessment, take the information and apply it by solutions, may it be engineering solutions or operational response procedures. So that was absolutely key. Uh, everyone's been held accountable. They're being, it's, this is an ongoing process right now to do just that, protect our assets, uh, identify the vulnerability and introduce those mitigating actions. So it's a, it was a you know, a huge thing that's and, and really a game changer. Ten years ago, I think we were in a really bad position. Today, we are not near as bad. Still a long way to go, but that effort right there changed the landscape. Bill, you might want to add something, too, about how a Carrington event is not the only issue. The day-to-day -day degradation. Yeah. Right. So then that, that's the with, with the power grid, especially in the higher latitudes, even with the moderate to, uh, we have the, the categories of one through five on our scale, three to four, categories three to four storms happen fairly regularly. Uh, so the, the threshold, in fact, to Tammy's point is three. We advise the entire grid through, through a notification process when we hit the three level storming out of one through five, because at that point, they start experiencing some problems. Uh, so we get that we're to kind of in a conservative approach, but we've got to make sure they're very well aware of what's happening so they can do the necessary, necessary things to keep the lights on. Great. I think, uh, well, I'm a little relieved to hear that, <laughs> that some positive progress has been made in recent years. Um, that is concerning. Uh, I, I wonder if I could use my privilege as moderator to ask a quick question. We've had a number of um, space diplomacy lab panels and um, events centered around satellite meg mega constellations and issues around space junk um, and, and also electromagnetic spectrum management. Um, so I was wondering if you could revisit the um, kind of uh, uh, event involving SpaceX losing a few dozen um, of its satellites and speak to the the, you know, the, the risk of having a Kessler syndrome-like um, cascade of um, collisions between satellites that are no longer um, dynamically operable after, after a solar event. Yeah. So go ahead, Jenny. No, I, I'll just get it started and Bill, you could um, 
you could chime in here. So the one thing about the SpaceX event is <clears throat> they launched into lower Earth orbit. And when they had an issue, those satellites did exactly what they were supposed to do. They, were, they came back and burned up in the atmosphere. And so ensuring that uh, that is the scenario for others, uh, if there's a, a failure um, in operations, figuring out how to get it out of that space and not create the space junk is something I think we're moving towards, being aggressive um, on those timelines where decommissioned satellites must find a way uh, to come back down to Earth um, and, and not be that floating space junk. And so that is something I know that this uh, th there's been a big push in these past few years as these mega uh, constellations uh, have been coming online. And so, Bill, um, if you want to add on to that. Yeah, so after the after the incident last year, I had mentioned that that, that was a, that was a, an awakening, an eye opener. Uh, we we called for a bit. This event just happened two weeks ago in, in Boulder. We had a three day exercise workshop. Uh, and we brought in SpaceX and Spire, Sierra Space, uh, Planet Labs, many of those groups with the, with the uh, mega constellations to discuss going forward, recognizing that the changes in the space environment can have profound effects. Now, granted, the density changes uh, at 200 kilometers where the incident happened with SpaceX a lot different than five or 600 kilometers where their uh, resting orbit is. However, it is our big fear on, an, on the big event, on an extreme event, a 1989 event even, uh, when, we, when we lost, the, uh, back then there was so much less uh, debris and, and spacecraft in orbit, but we lost uh, up to a thousand pieces we were tracking there at NORA during that storm. So during a, for a big, big event, we do have a lot of concern that the effects are going will extend up into four, five, six hundred kilometers. Um, so we're working closely with the Office of Space Commerce, uh, who are and obviously are now are taking over. The DOD doesn't want to be managing the space, the, the satellite environment anymore. Uh, for, for with all these mega constellations going up, they just want to concentrate on their DOD national security interests. So the Office of Space Commerce in the Department of Commerce is standing up and have been funded now to do so, this operational capability to do the space traffic management, the uh, conjunction analysis, analysis, collision avoidance activity, space weather will be key piece to that. Um, the, there's, we're, we're letting them get spun up right now. They're, they're big... Their big uh, effort push right now is to get people in that office. They had half a dozen people at the beginning of the year, and they've got all sorts of jobs out in the street right now to spin this whole activity up. But we've got to work closely with them to make sure we have all those processes in place to get the right information uh, in the in the right hands for these folks, uh, so that they can do the right thing to prevent any kind of a, a Kessler syndrome or any kind of collision. Period. So we recognize it as perhaps the biggest challenge going forward to our services is, make, is getting that right. It's just too much at stake here, and we all appreciate it and are you know, doing what we can with our modeling and prediction capabilities to to support. Uh, safe operations at Leo. I hope that helps. Thank you. Yes. I might open up the floor for one or two more questions. Are there any from the, um, the other members of the lab? Or any of your students, Giovanni? Yeah, there is. Uh, hi, uh, Rick. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentations. And definitely uh, we realize you work in that in that space all the time but for us this is reassuring but also scary and uh, there is uh, before i ask a question on behalf of my class there is a question from emma uh, how might atmospheric changes caused by climate change alter the threat threats impact of space weather are there efforts to better integrate space weather considerations in our cl climate and emergency predictions So I'll just say this, that it's, it's pretty much accepted that what we experience on the surface of the earth is about a 0.1% variation in solar irradiance over the cycle. 
which we don't th believe affects climate much. Now, uh, should we, back in 1645 to right up to the early part of the 18, 1715 or so, there was a period of, we call it the Monda Minimum, where there was essentially no sunspots in the, in the cycles. We were observing the sun back then, and that period uh, correlates kind of quite nicely with, with the mini ice age period. So we rec recognize that, that that total solar irradiance w may change if we get weak cycles or no cycles over an extended period of time, then it will influence climate a little bit. But as of the case since then, in the last 200 years, the, uh, that, that's very small, 0.1% uh, variation, we believe has had little effect. So we haven't really incorporated, certainly not in the operation side of the house, obviously, from my perspective. But I think I'm speaking very loosely for the research community. I mean, there's a lot of efforts on the way to understand that 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 connection. But um, I don't know if my colleagues have anything else to add to that. No, Bill, you're right. We actually held a joint seminar, uh, the Space Weather Program and the Climate Services Program, about two years ago. We had the world's, no, probably about three years now ago, the, uh, the world's leading expert on that same issue, how the solar input may drive changes on the planet and the climate. And it really is, it's, it's still to be determined. So as Bill mentioned, so it's just the solar uh, cycle fluctuates so slowly compared to that on Earth that really trying to understand and appreciate that connection is something that the, the research community is still trying to figure out. So that, that is an excellent question. So thank you. I don't want another monitor minimum. I was just going to say, I don't want another monitor minimum because it's not good for, for, for the job here. <laughs> we have no space weather eruptions for 50 years. We'll all be out of a job in the Space Weather Prediction Center. Great. Would you like to ask the question by Jonathan? And then I have, I have two questions from the students, which I will summarize, but sure. great, would you like to ask? Yeah, so uh, uh, Jonathan Wiener, who's online, has asked, for a very large CME or similar global event, would preparation by one country, such as by the U.S., be effective? Or to what extent would international coordination and cooperation also be needed to prevent major global impacts? So, um, you know, back in 2019, an, an important document that came out of FEMA, they identified two natural hazards that had consequence for the whole nation, even the globe. One, pandemic. And we learned a lot about the effects of, of a, a global phenomena like that, especially on our supply chain issues and whatnot. The other thing they identified was space weather. So it's recognized uh, uh, by many that if we have a big space weather event, that issue is going to come into play. And let me just give you an example of where, and it's part of our strategy now internationally to mitigate it. We've got these big transformers that we're relying on in this country, 500 and 765 kilovolt transformers. Many of them and the parts for them are made overseas. If we had a catastrophic event, big space weather event, there's two scenarios with the grid. One is it just trips it out, essentially like blowing a fuse, we'll recover in hours or days. But the other is losing those big transformers to physical damage, burning of the windings and whatnot. And if that was the case, where are we gonna get the parts, especially if there's a global impact and other nations are feeling the effects of it. So part of our strategy has been to as you can imagine, build them here. So efforts got on the way uh, about maybe a little less than a decade ago at some of our big plants, Mitsubishi and, and uh, Tennessee and other plant down in Georgia to do just that to, so that we could be self-sufficient here. And if we have that big event, we're not gonna be relying on our international colleagues. However, recognize that that's just with the big transformers. It's, it's usually critical, granted, but across the board, if we have a big space weather event, like the pandemic, we could see big, big supply chain issues. And again, come back to one of my slides on the international co co coordination, we're doing what we can, but we're never really gonna get to a point where I feel we're, we're, um, we won't suffer significant consequences uh, because of the global nature of space weather, especially on supply chain issues. 
Thank you. I know we are running out of time, so I would like to ask two questions on behalf of the class. Well, and remember, this is a space uh, economy slash economics class. So uh, the questions are definitely about uh, Eric. Where is the question? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so one question is about the, so since you talked about SpaceX and other satellites, uh, corporations, uh, what about insurance companies? Uh, have they been involved in the process? Because definitely uh, they are uh, probably worried about what's going to happen. Yeah, so I um, back about a decade ago, I participated in meetings in uh, several of the reinsurance groups. Uh, and I participated in meetings at Lloyd's of London for example, so if you if you actually Google Lloyd's of London space weather, you'll see the uh, documents that came out of Lloyd's to address space weather. And I'm struggling here just to remember the the, the group from Switzerland, um, Zurich Re Reinsurance. Uh, yeah, they they have uh, they have addressed space weather as well. So it's it's now the the, the, the insurance companies have said that if we have uh, that big catastrophic event that knocks out those transformers, which were identified in some reports back a, a decade ago as a multi-trillion dollar impact, there's nothing they can do. They cannot insure for that right. uh, kind of thing. So uh, from the, the lesser events, as I had mentioned, without the transformer damage and that kind of huge consequence, uh, they, they, can, they can play a role, but they clearly stated if they cannot manage some of the scenarios that have been presented uh, for the extreme event. Yeah, and, and I'll add to, to I don't want to call Tammy out, but Tammy through the advisory group, you know, has that commercial sector uh, represented. And uh, one of the actions that they have um, as a priority is to assess that economic impact uh, and really do that risk assessment. And so, uh, Tammy, did you want to add anything about how we are incorporating sort of that in economic impact piece that is critical for the insurance in industry in making the decisions? Yeah, that was one of our recommendations is to do a better economic analysis of the impacts of space weather. And then also to look at space weather in the larger picture with all the other natural disasters and risks. Um, the UK and other countries do this. Um, and so then you can try to get funding based on what your relative risks are. Is it a hurricane, an earthquake, et cetera, et cetera. And the other thing I'll add, since I have the, the floor, so to speak, is um, the NOAA administrator uh, earlier this year was asked the question at a national conference of what he thought the first trillion dollar U.S. natural disaster would be. And without hesitating a moment, he said space weather. Mm -hmm. So then you're getting into the numbers that Bill's talking about. Thank you very much. I think that uh, we have really used a lot of your time and uh, uh, Brit would you like to end this. Yeah, thank you all again. Um, this has been incredibly educational, um, a little terrifying, <laughs> as Giovanni mentioned, but also uh, giving us a little bit of security that these things are being worked on by very serious and well-informed people. So, um, so thank you all again for joining us. Thanks uh, to the many of you who joined online and um, we hope to see you all at our next events. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you also on behalf of my course here.